Welcome and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Leonardo Bigazzi. I'm the curator of Lo Schermo dell'Arte. And this is the first talk of the festival this year uh, that we are co-organizing with uh, NAM Nota Museum and Manifattura Tabacchi, also in the frame of the exhibition um, Resisting the Trouble, Moving Images in Times of Crisis, uh, that unfortunately, as you all know, uh, we had to postpone because of the COVID crisis. Um, be before I introduce my guest today, um, I want to use, of course, this opportunity not only to thank all the team here at Manifattura Tabacchi, I, we are unfortunately I'm connected from my house because, as you might know, in Tuscany there is a sort of light lockdown, and unfortunately we, we were not able to be present on site. Uh, but I want to invite all of you um, to visit the exhibition as soon as it will be a, we will be able to to open it. Um, also, for uh, the one you who don't know, uh, but as you know, we, we have the festival online at the moment. We have almost uh, over 42 films uh, online available on My Movies. And uh, um, uh, they unfortunately, they're only visible from Italy. So I say this to friends that might be connected from other countries. But if, if, you, um, if you are interested, please subscribe. They're available until the 22nd of November. Go on My Movies Go on our website, and hopefully you will find some interesting films to watch. Um, you can all find all the info on our website. So the title of the talk today is uh, Duchamp is our lawyer. And uh, without further ado, I want to introduce our guests. So uh, let's see if they're here with us. Uh, hello, Kenneth. It's wonderful to have you here. Ciao, Francesco. Franceschi. Ciao. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm really, really delighted and extremely happy to to have you here. Kenneth Goldsmith is uh, the founder of Ubu Web, uh, a very important online archive that, uh, uh, for all of us uh, working with moving images, has been a, a point of reference and a very important uh, source of uh, moving images online and the author of over 30 uh, collections of poetry. Um, so I, it would take a long, long time to list all the uh, writings of Kenneth. So uh, the only thing I'm going to name is the two, uh, uh, the most recent books that are translated in Italian, uh, which is Control, plus C, Control C, Control V, published by Nero Edition. I think this is something you could you should definitely check out. And uh, Francesco Urbano Ragazzi is a curatorial duo interested in the narratives of the era of connectivity. Uh, in, in 2015, they curated the Internet Saga, a solo exhibition of Jonas Mekas. I think I have the catalog around here on the, on the shelf. Uh, and, uh, and they're also very important, the director of the Church of Chiara Fumai, the archive that is responsible for preserving the memory and the work of Chiara. And, they're about to curate and open a beautiful show in uh, Geneva that unfortunately they had to postpone as well. But together with Kenneth, they did uh, a wonderful, incredible project in Venice that I'm sure they're gonna go in depth once I pass the word to you. So before I, I leave you the floor, I want to tell to the audience that we will take questions. So throughout the talk, please uh, leave some comments on the, on the Facebook page and on all our links and we will be able to uh, take questions at the end uh, of the presentation. So, Francesco and Kenneth, I'll, I'll leave the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Leonardo. Uh, thanks to all the team at uh, Scarmo dell'Arte. Uh, even if we are not uh, there in Florence physically, and we, we during these uh, months of preparation, uh, of this talk, uh, we really, really felt uh, your uh, your proximity. Uh, so thank you, really, thank you so much. So we are here to talk about uh, an amazing uh, book, mainly uh, written by uh, Kenneth Goldsmith, uh, entitled uh, "Duchamp is my lawyer," uh, and it's amazing because it it tells the story of uh, Yubu Web. Uh, um, Ubu.com uh, is uh, one of the, uh, maybe, I, I think the biggest uh, uh, online shadow archives uh, dedicated not only to contemporary cinema uh, and to avant-garde cinema, but uh, uh, to avant-garde uh, in, uh, in all its forms. Uh, Kenneth Goldsmith is, of course, uh, well-known, so instead of uh, 
presenting him and telling uh, um, what, uh, what he has done, what he has achieved. Uh, uh, I thought it would be interesting to know uh, how we started to work, uh, uh, to work together. Uh, from our perspective, from, from the perspective of me and, and Francesco, uh, it all started uh, in 2015 when invi we invited uh, the um, avant-garde Lithuanian uh, filmmaker Jonas Mekas uh, to exhibit uh, uh, his work at a show in Venice uh, in conjunction with the, with the Venice Biennale. Uh, we invited uh, Jonas uh, to start uh, our, um, our exhibition series, uh, The Internet Saga, uh, because we thought that uh, um, Jonas's work in particular, but the work uh, uh, he, he made uh, with, uh, with uh, the, the new American cinema group, uh, in a sense, anticipated uh, the uh, the nascence of, of, of the internet, anticipated the internet. Uh, they invented uh, um, new formats for, for cinema. They intended uh, cinema as a way to communicate uh, with their friends, with their peers. Uh, um, uh, in a way, they, uh, they really uh, um, treated the moving images the way we are treating, uh, treating them uh, nowadays uh, um, online. Um, uh, we, we invited Jonas to, to do this show and then and yet we discovered that uh, many, uh, many filmmakers, many artists uh, of, uh, of this generation uh, didn't, didn't really uh, understood uh, uh, di the digital culture. Uh, for Jonas was a little bit different because he, he, worked, uh, um, he worked online. Uh, he, he made uh, an amazing project uh, um, of cinema, of online, uh, of online cinema. Uh, but anyway, the, the feeling towards, uh, towards the, the digital world and the internet uh, were mixed feelings. So we, we thought uh, that the, uh, the, the point of conjunction between, uh, between uh, them, between Jonas's generation of filmmakers uh, and, uh, and the youngest generation of filmmakers uh, was exactly Kenneth Goldsmith, uh, Kenneth. Uh, be, uh, of course, uh, uh, you know Kenneth for, uh, for being uh, uh, a poet, the poet who brought uh, uh, the ready-made uh, into literature and into the online realm, um, and also for being the founder of uh, of Ubu Web uh, in 1996. Uh, so we, when we were um, when we were um, in New York to create another show uh, by by Jonas, uh, we immediately decided to to invite him uh, to dinner to create this link, um, and again. Um, uh, I, I have to say uh, the, the feelings were uh, pretty much mixed uh, on that occasion. We started talking uh, with uh, with Kenneth at the occasion of the dinner, and she expressed the uh, he expressed the will to uh, to print uh, um, the Hillary Clinton emails, uh, uh, the the emails. Uh, um, who got, uh, which got uh, Hillary Clinton lose the 2016 uh, election, uh, probably. Uh, we find uh, a place uh, uh, again in Venice to present, uh, to present this project, uh, but uh, I will not talk about this uh, ad adventure uh, at this occasion. Uh, we succeeded uh, together with Kenneth, we printed the, uh, the Hillary Clinton emails uh, in the form of, uh, uh, of Kenneth's uh, poetry. Uh, and, uh, um, and Hillary Clinton also performed uh, uh, at his show. Uh, but uh, uh, on that occasion, on the occasion of the Hillary Clinton emails, uh, we also decided to show 
um, a selection of film, films and videos from uh, UbuWeb. Uh, because we perceived uh, that uh, UbuWeb uh, not only as an archive, uh, but uh, uh, as an artwork uh, in itself, uh, and perfectly coherent with, uh, with uh, Kenneth's uh, uh, artistic, uh, artistic practice. Um, of course, uh, this choice uh, is, uh, is questionable, we will ask Kenneth uh, what, uh, what he thinks about, uh, about it. Uh, and uh, a series of questions re related to, to the nature uh, uh, of moving images uh, today and the way of showing it uh, uh, arose. Uh, and we really hope that this conversation uh, will be a way to deepen uh, in these kind of, of questions. Uh, Francesco, would you like to add uh, something before, before we start our conversation with, uh, with Kenneth? Yeah, very briefly, just, uh, just a reference to the, to the book and, uh, and to the title. Uh, I show, I'll show you, uh, if I'm able to do it, uh, some, something from the book itself. Uh, voila. So, I don't know if you can see. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So basically, basically, uh, you will see. I mean, the, the Duchamp is my lawyer. Is the new book uh, just published? I mean, it's uh, it, it was uh, uh, during the last months uh, uh, that uh, uh, some way, uh, uh, as you can read, it's the polemics, pragmatics, and poetics of the web, and uh, it's uh, the story of the last twenty-five years, more or less. Of Ubu Web, and uh, we we took the, the license to change a bit the title and uh, transform it in our lawyer, uh, because some way uh, talking about Venice also uh, Duchamp was really our lawyer. We, did, we when we, we decided to print together all the, the that, all the emails we were talking about, but also when we decided to. Um, to project the films on the on the uh, on the big screen of the X Cinema Theater, uh, I mean, some way we don't have to to ask permission for permissions, but uh, we, we made it. And uh, so, uh, but uh, I want to I want to start for, from I mean, for the very beginning of the book, uh, asking Kenneth because. Uh, um, this is the first page of the very first page of the book. So again, we have to to face the uh, the the question of the um, the, the issue of uh, of copyrights since the beginning, and so we have to respect copyrights. And this is the I mean the first page. But then there is an amazing uh, sentence and like a, a quotation from Virgil Abloh, which is the very title of the book. So sometimes, some way, is the, our protector, I will say. And uh, as you can read, I often tell people that Duchamp is my lawyer, is legal premise to validate what I'm doing. So um, I, I leave the floor to Kenneth and uh, asking him, uh, how can you uh, and all of us uh, uh, becoming like a community, so uh, leaving uh, our uh, unicity and uh, our ego, uh, find our lawyer in Duchamp. Well, I often say that there should be not just one Uber web, but a thousand. And the reason that there are not a thousand is that people are afraid of copyright. I'm not so afraid of copyright. So I was able uh, for 25 years to create UberWeb uh, without permission, uh, basically illegally, and nothing ever happened to me. So I want to say to everyone, if it never happened to me in 25 years, it's probably not going to happen to you either. Um, you have to know the material that you're dealing with. If UberWeb was putting up Hollywood films, maybe, just maybe, it would be a different story. But then again, there are many torrent sites that put up Hollywood films 
that don't have too much trouble either. So I can't really speak for them, but I also know that in the film community and in the avant-garde film community, um, you have to know what you're dealing with. The, there's not much money. So when you put something up, you're not really taking much money away from the filmmakers. Sometimes it happens that because of the films are on Uberweb, the filmmakers make more money because people get interested in their work and actually want to screen them. And uh, we make sure on Uberweb to keep the poor quality uh, of the films so that when you go to the cinema, you can have a good experience. This is not a substitute. Uh, it's an inferior experience. So my idea is that maybe you get to know something, kind of a sketch, before you actually see the painting. Maybe the sketch makes you want to see the painting. Um, and that's sort of the way it's worked out. Um, also, I mean, film, I don't know anything about this world. <laughs> you know, I'm a poet. I don't know anything about avant-garde cinema. But I get the sense that um, it's a small community. And it's important to be respectful. You know, we have good connections with the film and video distribution, uh, film and video distributors uh, like Lux or EAI or Video Data Bank. And um, we're in touch. And sometimes, you know, they ask me to take something down. And, uh, you know, if it's reasonable, I, I take it down because, you know, it's, you know, we want to work together. We want to, you know, uh, you know, so you have to know your community and you have to be okay with the community. The other thing is, UberWeb never has money. It doesn't touch money. I don't get any money. The filmmakers don't get any money. <laughs> Nobody gets any money. And if I was making a lot of money, I would think it would be right for me to pay everybody on the site. But if I'm not making any money and there's no money exchanged, we take no grants, uh, we pay nothing, then it's a different situation. So over 25 years, we've sort of, we've made some mistakes, absolutely, uh, but we've sort of figured out how to make this thing work. It's kind of a, 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 a utopia, very fragile, very delicate utopia, but um, I guess it's working for 25 years. <laughs> Uh, Kenneth, maybe it's interesting to know how did you get uh, interested in avant-garde cinema, also to understand uh, how it all started. Well, it all started with concrete poetry. <laughs> I don't know if, if you even know what that is, but it's a very obscure um, movement of poetry from mostly, you know, beginning in the 1950s, where people around the world began to use letters as images. So you could use words, but not really care what they meant. It was more like uh, words, how, the way words looked and the way words sounded. And therefore, uh, unlike most poetry, it did, never needed to be translated. It had an international audience um, and was also kind of, um, um, yeah, it was a universal movement. And I began in 1996 loving concrete poetry. And no, you know, I think it was very uh, unfashionable at the time. Um, and I began scanning concrete poems and putting them up on the web, just, you know, like, wow, I can do this. And soon there was a group of friends. I would mail out a link. Oh, I, I put some concrete poems on the web because uh, at that time the web was not graphic. It was all uh, uh, Unix. And I told them, oh, I have a few concrete poems on a website. Nobody really knew what a website was then, but okay. And soon there were a few people that followed uh, concrete poetry. Then a little while later, when sound began to come on the internet, when we, you remember we used to have real audio? <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so I began to put up what is called sound poetry. And sound poetry is like concrete poetry except um, it uses the sound and the intonation of the words as music 
uh, formally rather than what the words meant, so to speak. So we had concrete poetry and then we had sound poetry. And I, I began like ripping uh, LPs from my collection of concrete and sound poetry, uh, sound poetry. And then um, I wanted to include the sound poetry of John Cage. And John Cage often did these beautiful, weird readings of letters. They were really strange and gorgeous. And, you know, his voice was so great. But then other times he would put an orchestra playing modern music with his reading of it. And I thought, ah, oh, this is strange. What am I, what am I going to do with this? It's no longer sound poetry. It's like sound poetry and avant-garde orchestral music. And I thought, oh shit, what do I do? I want to include this, but it's no, it's now it's something else. At which point I had to just say, maybe we don't call it sound poetry anymore but we call it avant-garde music. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> but I thought, well, now we can start to include all the other strange things, like Luciano Berrios, Omaggio, uh, where Kathy Barbarian is singing the words of James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake. You know, like, what do you do with Berrio, someone like Berrio, or Kathy Barbarian, who's a sound poet but she's also a um, avant-garde trained vocalist. So I thought if we call this avant-garde sound now, it's a little more open and we can invite Kathy Barbarian and we can also invite Luciano Berrio. And uh, I thought, oh, well, this is kind of better now. And then uh, it just grew. And then when film and, and uh, video started, I thought, well, we should just, you know, put avant-garde things in film and video. And it grew from there. And so the site began with concrete poetry and sound poetry and became something called avant-garde. I don't know what avant-garde is. I think there's a lot of problems with the word avant-garde. It has patriarchal, militaristic, colonial uh, uh, connotations, connotations of war, of, of aggression, you know, of masculinity. I mean, it's a bad word. And I kind of love uh, taking uh, a word that you can't use anymore because nobody uses avant-garde really, you know, you can't really say that and using it in the wrong way, kind of queering uh, the term avant-garde. Um, so my idea with the avant-garde was then, because I don't really know what the avant-garde was, was to kind of, make it impure and make it unmasculine and, you know, to kind of queer the term, so to speak. And so I began to try to find um, traditions that were outside of typical avant-garde um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and expand it to outsiders and visionaries and street poets and, and uh, that kind of thing. So you will have in Uberweb the classical avant-garde and the out and the and the weird avant-garde, and I think that that feels better to me somehow. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, somewhere in the book you say that uh, uh, the, the 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 host of Uberweb now is somewhere between Zagreb and the Iceland, but. Mm. I mean, uh, how did you build the infrastructure at the very beginning in 1996? Well, um, you know, poets need a job. <laughs> we don't, we need, we need, you know. <laughs> so I decided when the internet came that I would learn HTML in like 1993 or something. Just for, you know, that seemed to be the thing and, and I could get a job doing that. So I learned a little bit of HTML in the early 90s, and I built UberWeb. And UberWeb is still run on the same exact HTML that it was in 1996. As a matter of fact, every, I never really learned very much. I'm very primitive. Every page is just a copy of the page from 1996. I never wrote a new page. Um, and, uh, You know, it works, and it works for people around the world. Many people around the world uh, uh, don't have good internet. There is a digital divide. Uh, the digital divide is real. 
Um, so you want to make sure that people can see the site on bad cell phones, on 3G service, it still works, you know. Uh, to this day, uh, the front page of UberWeb is only four kilobytes, four KB, like, <laughs> that's it. There's nothing there, just a little bit of HTML and one picture of Samuel Beckett. And it works. I, why should I do anything any different? It, it, it works beautifully that way. So, I mean, I never knew what I was doing. I know, I know, I know nothing about this stuff. I, I, my dream is that somebody would actually do fucking UberWeb the right way. You know, somebody could, could, could re who really knows it could do it well. But at this point, with, 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 with maybe now 6,000 films on UberWeb and tens or hundreds of thousands of MP3s, um, you can't do it the right way. It would cost too much money to clear the permission and get the rights and <laughs> do the high resolution, you know, and write everything properly. I mean, it's, UberWeb's broken. It's fucked up. It's wrong. It's like an artist idea of what avant-garde is. I mean, I have nothing. I have no degree. I have a bachelor in sculpture <laughs> from 1984. I know, I know nothing about this stuff. So I always say, please, somebody come and fucking just do it right. And then I don't have to do it anymore. But uh, unfortunately, today, this would cost millions and millions of euros to do, to do it the way I've done it. Um, and uh, there's a really funny footnote in the book. I wish I had included it in the text of what it actually cost to put, if MoMA wanted to put one film up on MoMA's site, you know, MoMA has no, no artist videos. UberWeb has 6,000, 6, MoMA has zero because it costs them, because they're MoMA and they have to do it right, it would cost them so much money <laughs> to, put up, to put up the uh, a, a film. Thousands, $25,000, uh, I don't know, to put up like one, one movie <laughs> and lawyers fees and contracts and all the things that you know, these places have to do. On UberWeb, you know, I can kind of sip some whiskey at night and put up you know, 30, 30 movies at night and, and wake up the next morning and the, the, the uh, archive has that much more. MoMA has nothing. UberWeb has everything. <laughs> That's not right. Something's not right here. <laughs> Something's broken, I, you know. Uh, as, I, as I said earlier, um, we, we consider uh, UberWeb not only an archive, but also an artwork. Uh, and I think that somewhere we also defined uh, UberWeb uh, as an almost ready-made. Uh, in the sense that uh, it is already made, that, but it has also some glitches. Uh, the videos and films are presented in low quality. So it, it's almost, the, this dimension of almostness uh, uh, really characterize, uh, characterizes uh, uh, UberWeb. Uh, but, uh, and also the sentence, Duchamp is my lawyer, uh, make, us, make us think uh, that UberWeb is some sort of artwork, but what's your idea? I don't know. Sometimes people want me to claim it as an artwork. They did for the documenta, you know, with uh, 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 Carolyn. Uh, uh, Carolyn. Christophe, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's her name? I forget her name. Christophe. Christophe. Yeah. And they asked me to write a little book claiming it as an artwork. I said, okay, I'll do that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think that would be too egotistical for me. I mean, I could say it's my artwork, and maybe that's my kind of legal excuse for it existing. But then it's kind of gross. You know, then, you, you know, then, it's, then it's not an archive. Then it becomes like my stamp all over. And I, I, some people know I'm, I'm involved with UberWeb, but I try to keep it a little bit low. So that it's just a piece of magic on the internet. That's what I want. I don't want them to have to think, oh, this is Kenneth Goldsmith's artwork that I'm going into. That's horrible. I mean, nobody likes that. It's better if it's, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, you know, I have a mixed feeling about that. 
I mean, it's similar to all the Hillary Clinton emails and all the kind of ready-mades that I do with my own literature. But then you sort of have to deal with me. And a lot of people don't want to deal with me. Um, because, you know, it's better to just, like, it's imagine if you go to a, a library and every time you go to the library to take out a book, you have to think about the name of the man that put the book there. You don't want to do that. You want the fucking book, right? Even And there is a man or a woman, but most likely a man in traditional, who put the book there. Uh, there is somebody, but you don't want to think about that. You just want to go and you want to get your book off the off the shelf. I think that's more more beautiful uh, idea. Uh, so to me, yeah, I'm, I'm a little mm, not so, but sometimes people think of it that way and I'm okay with that. If they wanna make an argument for that, that's okay. I just would hate to say on the front page of UbuWeb, UbuWeb, an artwork by Kenneth Goldsmith. <laughs> ah. <laughs> that would be horrible. <laughs> No, no, it's better. It's better that, you know, it's better. It's better the other way. Okay. Some way it's interesting to, to, to see the fact that it is, it is a really a, a phantasmagoric artwork. It's like collective artwork of many uh, potential friends and uh, spirits, uh, the spirits of avant-garde in a sort of zeitgeist. I think so. I, I think so. But the avant-garde film world, you know, we've we, we've had a lot of trouble over the years uh, with probably the people that are watching this video right now. Uh, <laughs> I don't think they they don't like Ubu Web. I mean, for many years they thought Ubu Web was responsible for killing uh, avant-garde cinema. They had to blame someone, so they blamed. They said, "Oh, that website, Jonas Meek has hated Ubu Web. He's ah, you know, they're." No, 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 they're, they're destroying, <laughs> it's destroy It's not. It, I wish UberWeb had the power to either make or destroy anything, but it doesn't. Uh, UberWeb arises in a moment out of a necessity um, uh, and, and it happens so that, that people, and I talk about this in the book, uh, people stop renting videos, the inter there's bootlegs circulating on the internet, um, there's library types of systems that are going into place for this kind of work. And uh, for many years, people really wanted to point the finger at UberWeb and say, you are responsible for the death of our art form. And then, you know, uh, that was a big battle uh, that I had to fight. And no, I don't fight it so much anymore. I think they understand that um, things exist now. No, okay. so. 10 years ago or 15 years ago, I thought it was like either film or digital. Now, of course, we understand we have film and we have digital and they kind of go together. And sometimes you see something in a beautiful 35 millimeter screening in a dark room. And other times you see it on YouTube in a shitty quality or Uber web. And one doesn't really eradicate the other. As a matter of fact, what we found is that they both reinforce each other. Um, they help each other. They can work together. One doesn't replace the other. And, you know, again, we had some and continue to have some trouble with galleries. Galleries are much worse than the avant-garde film world. The galleries think that <laughs> they can control their artists' videos on UberWeb. They, they, they claim moral, moral rights. They, you know, they claim all sorts of things, uh, they, you know, presentational rights and which is total bullshit as well. So now I think I fight the gallery uh, more than I fight the uh, avant-garde film world. They don't. Nobody likes UberWeb except for the people that use it, you know. But it's controversial. It's. I mean, imagine you build a thing with five thousand films and shitty quality, and you don't ask anyone's permission. You see, if we had to ask permission, we wouldn't exist. Never ask permission. Later you can deal with it, you know, but don't, if you ask for permission, you're never going to get anywhere. Just do it. It's, and it usually works out. If you have an honest and a good intention, people will generally um, respect that. If you have an, uh, an evil intention, like if you want to take those movies and sell them and make profit, then people are going to get angry at you. But if you love the films, and, and, and which I do, and you love the genre, and you, 
you want to work together to make this work more well known and it's clear then i think people will leave you alone but you, you know your intentions must be good otherwise you should get destroyed talking about uh, galleries uh, in the book uh, you tell the story of a of a gallery that tried to take some uh, some films down because they were part of a um, video installation so they claim that we have uh, um, lost the integrity of of the artwork uh, how do you deal with uh, with this word integrity is, uh, is this a value in which sense you don't respect the uh, you 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 feel you are allowed to not to respect the 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 integrity of an artwork on on ubu i don't know most people can't see the the artwork as it's meant to be you have to have privilege in order to do that you have to have money to go where it is most people on ubu web are not in those centers or not in that financial position if you want to see the the thing correctly in new york in the gallery you have to somehow get yourself to new york most people don't live in new york who love this work you have to fly there and then you have to buy a hotel <laughs> and then you have to pay the admission to get into the museum and you have to get expensive food and taxis and who can do that so what's the integrity you know it's only for the rich people it's only for the privileged people who can can have, can see that and afford to see that that's bullshit as a matter of fact i think it's the gallery's uh, uh, responsibility to put their films up on the web so that people can see them so they don't have to come but of course they won't do that because they're in a, in a um uh, a head where they think that uh Uh, if you put some if you give something away it's going to take something away from them you know some sort of shitty capitalism it's some sort of shitty uh, uh, market idea now the, now the problem is that the video is an infinitely reproducible media so the galleries try to market a video as being a unique object because you can sell if you tell a collector I'm going to pay charge you a hundred thousand euros for something that everyone can have, then of course they're not going to pay you that money. And this is what happened with Matthew Barney and his Cremaster cycle, you know, because they were limited editions in, in DVDs. But of course the minute, you know, anybody gets home, they make a DVD copy, so they don't have to use their real one. And then they give it to a friend and then it goes on the internet. And, and suddenly, I mean, I think the collector is a sucker for paying $100,000 for a fucking DVD. You've got to be an idiot. You know, and it'll get out there anyway. So I think that, you know, it's at odds, you know, and it's not like sculpture, you know, in sculpture, you would make a cast and then the first impression from the bronze cast was the best one. And number two was a little bit worse. And number three was a little bit worse, et cetera, et cetera. And so you make 10 and number 10 is like the worst one. Okay, but it's still okay. That's the end, and then you break the mold and you have 10 in the world, okay. I get it, that's not what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with reproducible media that's infinitely reproducible. So don't tell me that uh, you can only make one out of it. Uh, so I don't respect that, I don't, I don't like it, I don't, I don't believe in it, I think it's wrong. Uh, I also think that today uh, a cultural artifact has object Uh, I'm sorry, the cultural artifact has more power the more people that experience it. So that which can be seen by many is very powerful. That which can be seen by no one, although it may have economic value, is not useful and not powerful. So this is the digital distribution model, the, the notion of it. Uh, so I th actually, to answer your question, I think it's bullshit, and I think they're bullshit, and I think the uh, integrity is bullshit. And, um, you know, if you want to go there and you get it, integrity, good for you. It's nice, nice experience, but basically very few people. And now we're in COVID. How many people are going to see the beautiful integrity <laughs> uh, of the artwork? The museums are closed. What are you fucking going to do, right? So... It's all wrong. It's all fucking wrong. And I, I think it's, you know, cool to see something in a museum, cool to see something in a space. You're lucky if you can. 
but we need to have access for everybody who doesn't have access. And right now, no one has access. UberWeb has become more valuable in COVID, right? Because now it's, you know, now it's what you have instead of like what you wish you had. So right. in some way we, we are more Duchampian than before. Uh, I mean, internet is a Duchampian uh, experience some way, no? Uh, we are, uh, we can, uh, I mean, that's why maybe Duchamp, it's not just our lawyer, but our lawyer, the lawyer of all of us. Because uh, when, uh, when we go to the museum and uh, we start our uh, Instagram stories, like uh, um, uh, filming the, the exhibition, it's already a ready-made. Uh, we are like uh, projecting that that thing somewhere else, uh, and uh, and where is the integrity? The integrity? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, we are talking about integrity, uh, and maybe what I so from from one side we have Duchamp, but from the on the other we have all, we have all the other the other avant-garde, and that's why I think uh, even the low quality of the images becomes becomes another layer of Ubu web, another aesthetic level of the of, of this archive artwork. And yeah. uh, I was thinking to how um, yeah, this, this is very evident also in other books that you, you, you wrote, like um, Western Time on the Internet, this relationship between the avant-garde and the internet. So, for, for instance, I don't know, there is a, a, an aspect which is uh, more like the Dada, <laughs> the, yeah. another, the surrealistic yeah. over it's, it's, it's all there. You know, I often say that, that, that the classical avant-garde were like a bunch of airplanes, you know, that took off and then just crashed only, and then another airplane took off. So you have like, you know, the Cubist airplane, it takes off and then, then next comes the Dada airplane and it crashes and next comes the surrealist plane and it crashes and so forth and so forth. And that's the history of art is like a series of plane crashes, right? Of the avant-garde, one succeeded by the next. But my notion was always like, well, what if those planes never crashed and they kept flying into the 21st century and now we can understand them uh, through the internet. So, uh, you know, everybody says that our attention is shattered on the internet. And that to me sounds like surrealism. You know, uh, they love shattered attention. They didn't want to pay attention to one thing. You know, everybody says, you know, we're walking down the street like this, only looking at our phone. Well, it's a very surrealist because we're sort of in a dream space. We're here and we're not here. Uh, the surrealists love to sleep. Uh, people that talked in their sleep, that was their favorite thing. You know, they would sit in cafes and they'd go into a trance and maybe drink a little whiskey and then they'd start talking and fall asleep together and start talking in their sleep. So you're sort of here, but you're not here. The disjunction, okay? Or right now I'm looking at three screens on my, on my computer. And oftentimes there's, there's 25 windows and tabs that are open. And to me, this is the shattered spaces of cubism, right? Come on, you see many things happening from many different points of view at one time, and it's a fucking cubism, that's easy, right? Um, you know, you can think of the, uh, uh, the Wi-Fi and the network and the distribution as like the uh, uh, paint, paint splatter of Jackson Pollock. You know, the, 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 abs you know, the, 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 the field paint, color field painting is like the Wi-Fi, like our Wi-Fi networks. You know, it's all kind of there and it makes more sense uh, as, as, kind of, as kind of theory. And, you know, and the violence of the internet is very data. Uh, you know, the kind of violence of Twitter and the violence of social media and the violence and the anger. I mean, I think the Dadas, you know, Tristan Zara would be delighted by Twitter. Uh, yeah. You know, I think you think it would be very funny. You know, Breton would be uh, delighted by, by how we don't pay attention to what we're supposed to pay attention to. Picasso would be delighted by how confusing our interfaces is. These guys were like, actually predicted the digital age, yes. Absolutely. 
So Ubu Web, all avant-garde, all the times. So it's like the perfect <laughs> conjunction of all these avant-garde. Well, and, also, yeah, it's also, but you know, avant-garde is like I said, it's a bad word. <laughs> yeah, I think it's funny, you know. You know, nobody, nobody since the 1990s or something, even the 80s, you couldn't use that word anymore because of its bad connotation. And that's very punk. I love the um, line that Real Marcus draws in Lipstick Traces from Cabaret Voltaire to Johnny Rotten and all the way through uh, Situationist and Letterist, all the way up to, to punk rock. And I think Ubu Web is the next, the next stop on that, on that journey, absolutely. I love that. It's very punk rock. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I found a, a very uh, talking about avant garde and the collapse of the avant garde altogether. Um, there is also another interesting reference to the um, in the book, uh, of course, to the Situationists. Uh, I show you like the like one of the page of the book. Uh, yeah, now starting the sharing on the, sorry, voila. This is the, it's Guy Debord, of course. And uh, the, the sentence is like, uh, all the material published by the situation is international is in principle usable by everyone, even without acknowledgement without the preoccupation of literary property, you can make all the tournaments that appear useful to you. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we love them. And yeah, some way, I mean, uh, uh, it's the, the, uh, it could be like uh, the, the, the statement of Ubu Web. Yeah, well, I say we couldn't agree more, you know, and I, I'm reading now here, use it, use it in the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> and it is, people, I, if you go to the next page, but don't go, but if you went to the next page, you would see that, like, a lot of people, like DJs, looking for new and weird material, plunder UberWeb for dance music, which is great. So you can have Bruce Nauman on a, you know, shouting, you know, get out of my life in, you know, on a <laughs> dance floor in Sao Paulo. And they don't fucking even know anything about Bruce Nauman or minimalism or conceptualism. They don't care. It's like, wow, check out, I've seen things online. Check out this great uh, uh, source for the weirdest things you've ever heard. <laughs> I think I love it. How am I, I can't control how it's used. I, I, you know, it's just, you know, it's out there. And, you know, you can't ask me for permission. A lot of people find stuff on UberWeb that's nowhere else on the web and they say, Can, I'm sorry, but I need to um, uh, curate an exhibition. Can you give me permission to use this thing? And I, I, you know, I don't even answer anymore. I have on the page. I said, we never ask for permission. If you want permission, go find the artist because I can't give you permission for something I didn't get permission for. Stop it. Leave me alone. Yeah, yeah in the book, uh, uh, there is another sentence. Uh, don't ask for permission. Asking for permission only brings you... Uh, problems. Uh, then there is another one, uh, pretty interesting. Uh, piracy is preservation, and I think uh, both these sentences uh, are part of what you call uh, uh, folk law. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in the in the book, you claim a folk is the law. Uh, mm -hmm. well, to, something, something, yeah, called like community standards and norms. Listen, fan culture preserves things. People actually pirate things because they love them. So I'm gonna to say to all the artists out there, if somebody ever pirates you and bootlegs your work, you should thank them because they love you. And, um, you know, I think artists dream of being loved. Most artists don't get loved, right? And so if somebody goes out of their way to, to actually bootleg what you do, it means that you've actually succeeded on some incredible level. You should thank them for pirating your work. Uh, in the case of most of us, you're not really taking much money out of our pockets. As a matter of fact, <laughs> the day UberWeb was published, uh, I'm sorry, the day uh, Duchamp was my lawyer was published, it was leaked onto file sharing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, everybody could get it for free, of course. I mean, and I, I retweeted the link. You know, I put it on Facebook or on, on, on Twitter, 
And I think in one day, 2,000 people downloaded it, you know, which is great. And me, honestly, I'm, I don't make much money on this book. I'd rather have you, uh, you know, artists would have, you know, would, would, would like to have their ideas received. Most of us don't get a paycheck for, for what we do. We have to have jobs. Uh, we have to do other things for money. So we don't make money from books. I don't, anyway. I, I assume I'm typical. From a university press, forget it. Um, and that's why, uh, Francesco, when you showed the uh, copyright thing in the beginning, you know, that's what they have to do. And I have to sign everything that says yes, yes, yes. But, you know, nobody ever fucking will, nobody gets sued, you, you know, <laughs> for sharing a book about Uberweb, please. That's like, Who's going to spend money on that to sue you? Nobody. That's just not what they do. Yeah. So also, uh, you know, I mean, UberWeb never gets sued because who's going to sue somebody who loudly proclaims that they're not that they have no money and that they're not even touching money and they're not selling anything? It fucks everybody's head up. You say, but wait a minute, we're going to sue somebody for somebody who's for somebody who's giving something away? We're going to spend tens of thousands of dollars to stop somebody who's not even making profiting on our material. I mean, this is not, by the way, it's by the, by the letter of the law, it's illegal, but by the letter of folk law, this is the way the law actually works. There's folk law and there's real law. And, you know, Uberweb proves that folk law uh, is, uh, is actually the women's work, not real law. I think everybody needs to relax. A little bit. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, you know, many people on a blog will put up something and then they'll get a, a take a, a, a takedown notice from what looks to be a, like it's from a lawyer, you know, and they're scary to receive. But if you really understand what a, what a cease and desist order is, it's not, you're not going to get sued. You're not going to get a lawsuit. Most of the time it's sent by a, a robot that doesn't even know you, but they hope that you're going to get scared and take your shit down. And then they've accomplished what they wanted to accomplish without spending any money at all. You know, a cease and desist is uh, a, an invitation to a conversation. And sometimes it's a good conversation. I've, I've, when I get a cease and desist from, from like a big lawyer, I try to have a conversation with them. And I try to say, look, <laughs> We're not making any money here. We're trying to promote the work. Um, we love the work. We're actually doing you a favor by hosting this work. And oftentimes, a little bit of conversation, and, oh, we didn't realize that. We thought you were trying to sell it or steal it or misrepresent. No, 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 actually, I, I love what you're doing. And, you know, you sh you know it's all good. Um, and sometimes it's worked out really well, like one time, I got a letter from Yoko Ono's lawyers <laughs> and I thought, oh shit, you know, this is like the richest lady in the world. They want her things down from UberWeb. But when I explained what it was that we were doing on UberWeb and the historical placement of the work and how unavailable the work was, the lawyer for Ono said, okay, well, let me ask Yoko and see what she says. And the next day I got a letter back from Yoko Ono's lawyer saying, you may keep that up there. Yoko thinks it's it's a good idea to have it there. So this is great, you know. It was like it was. I was very, you know. She's great. She's not making any money on her screaming or or coughing for forty five minutes. Anyway, she's got enough money. So she says, "Okay, let's give this to the people." That's all, you know. And I have so many stories like this. Um, so I, I think if you don't worry when you receive a cease and desist, have a conversation. See what they say. They're not going to get sued. You know, it's not like you're, you're uh, you know, giving Kanye West, you know, records away. You know, not, you know, that's money. And sometimes I think, like, maybe I'm not, like, copyright isn't such a black and white issue. Like, maybe I don't know what it's like to have something worth millions of dollars. But maybe if I did, maybe I'd want to protect something that's worth millions of dollars. I don't know. I wish I had, but I don't. So in other words, um, what we do, Guy Debord's films, are you couldn't even sell them if you wanted to sell them. <laughs> so, you know, that's the kind, but you have to know the material you're dealing with. Sometimes when we deal with material that 
does have a little bit of economy, an economy around it, um, people can get a little touchy about that. For example, uh, we have um, we have a lot of Beckett, but Beckett Estate, which is very rich, never came after us. And there's uh, what's his name? I'm trying to think of uh, uh, the Bl British playwright. Oh fuck, I can't remember right now. There's so much stuff. The name will come to me in a minute. He's very good, and we have his stuff up. You know, he's kind of commercial, and sometimes we take it down for a little while, and then we put it back up six months later and they never find us again. <laughs> so you have to know what you're dealing with. But now the web is also an institution anyway. How do you feel about, uh, uh, about it? Uh, uh, I, I guess it's been around for so long that it became an institution. It really was not my plan. And I have no plan to make it permanent. Um, you know, it could go tomorrow. I always say to people, this is not meant to last forever, but you can download everything from the site, which is really fucking a lot of work, but you can do it. Um, uh, you know, I don't know. It was just a big accident. Google web, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'm persistent, you know, I, I believe in it, I keep doing it, and I, I never had any plan for it. And if it go, went away tomorrow, that would have been a beautiful thing. You know, nobody can buy it, it's too expensive. It's, I mean, it would be too expensive to like, how, how can I, also, I can't sell something I've stolen legally. I mean, it seems fucked up. Like, if I stole all this stuff, now you pay me a million euros. That's not gonna happen. That's not right. That's not right. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, nobody, by the way, nobody ever asked, offered me to buy it. You know, <laughs> I think like MoMA, you know, MoMA should, should, should take it over or something, but I, I, I just don't know. I don't know. 25 years is a really long time. Maybe I'll end it. I don't know. Hmm. But you know you, in the book, you say yeah, everything is temporary. Uh, do you ever, did you ever feel that, uh, uh, that Ubo uh, at, some po uh, at some point could be uh, obsolete. Huh? Yes. Yes, I did. A, 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 during the time of the MP3 blogs, they were doing such a good job. I thought, ah, why am I even doing Ubo web? Because I would take everything from the MP3 blogs, you know, in 2009 or something like that. And then I put it all up on Ubo web. I thought, wow, this is stupid. Why, why should I continue? when everybody is now being Uber web, but then mega upload and you know, all of the lawsuits began to go on those places and they all started to shut down. And in the end, Uber web still remained. And I thought, oh, okay, this is why, because Uber web is not connected to a corporation. Uber web is not reliant on funding. We don't get grants. Um, Uber web is not, is outside of uh, the law. You kind of can't, you know, it, uh, it's very, very difficult to shut UberWeb down. People sometimes have tried a little bit, not so bad. Um, but, you know, if you put your stuff on a corporation website and Mega Upload was a big corporation or Google or Vimeo or any of these places, then uh, they're going to shut you. Eventually, you're going to get shut down because they can, they can turn you off, and that's what happened. So UberWeb um, uh, turned out to last much longer than all of the other ones, uh, you know, because it wasn't connected to a corporation. You know, I don't have to ask for grants every year, which I'm going to get turned down for. You know, there's no, I don't ask for grants. There's no money, no money, zero, zero money for the whole thing. So, you know, they don't like my politics, you know, or, or you know, like a lot of uh, uh, museums are getting shut down because they're not being diverse enough. I don't give a shit, you, you know, <laughs> you know, you can protest UberWeb all you want. Uh, you know, I'm not contingent. I'm not. I'm, I, I don't have to do representation so I can get my money. I believe in representation. I believe in diversity, but because I believe in it, and I think it's the right thing to do. Not because I have to have X amount of uh, you know uh, uh, Native American uh, Indian artists on UberWeb so I can get get grants. That's not. I'm interested in good art made by Native Americans, made by, by Jews. I don't know, it doesn't matter. Good art is good art. 
and that's how that's how it should be. I don't I don't want to play those kind of politics, and I don't need to. It's free. UberWeb is free, <laughs> and there's no money. You'll never pay money for UberWeb. I'll close it before you have to pay money. UberWeb has no password, no membership. It's free. It's open, but it's also really hard to find because UberWeb is. Uh, I took it off of Google. You can't find UberWeb on Google. You can find links to UberWeb. You can find articles about UberWeb, but you actually all of the content that's on UberWeb is not on Google. You know, now people write write books about how to get your <laughs> Google rank higher. <laughs> UberWeb is off Google completely, so it's like underground. If you know about it, it's because somebody said, "Oh, there's this really cool thing you might be interested in." Just the way you used to hear about bands, you know, before MTV or something like that, you know? So a friend would give you a cassette and say, oh, you gotta check this band out. Friends tell friends and it becomes a beautiful community instead of, uh, inst you know, and there's no promotion, there's no advertising. Uh, UberWeb has no trackers, no sniffers, uh, no, no Google ads or whatever the fuck that's called. There's nothing, there's just 4K of HTML. Who you are and what you do is none of our business. All that kind of uh, uh, surveillance culture, that nobody surveils you on, on UberWeb. It's the way the web used to be, and it's the way the internet should be. You are free to do what you want there. Uh, so I'm very, very, very strong about these kind of uh, issues. Uh, uh, yeah, surveillance capitalism, no surveillance and no capitalism. Um, go, Francesco. Uh, have your criteria uh, about who to include uh, on web uh, changed over time? Yeah, I want to make it more diverse. UberWeb uh, came pre-packaged with a white Western male tradition. I mean, that was it. The avant-garde was white Western and male. So, okay, that's where you start, right? Uh, I, you know, but I thought it was very important to keep keep including other other traditions, other voices, because they're good. Um, and uh, you know, in a way, it, it it refutes that notion of classical avant-garde and the problems with it. You know, patriarchal, hegemonic, militaristic. Um, you know, I don't like any of that stuff. But I also I also also love it all. I love it also at the same time. So over time, I've tried to be more diverse, but I found, ironically enough, is that when certain uh, ethnic groups uh, become popular uh, as artists, then I get, uh, I get uh, takedown notices from their galleries. <laughs> so let's say there's a certain ethnicity group that was not included on UberWeb, and I worked really hard to put them on UberWeb. When they became marketable and popular, their representatives say, take that off of UberWeb. And I have to kind of fight them sometimes for that. I think that's the irony. You know, it's like you're so outside and, and then suddenly you want it, everybody wants it taken down. Um, now it's very hard to have something taken down on Ubu. I mean, Ubu is, is, is just recently we've added another uh, 10 layers of, of bulletproof security for UberWeb. So now a lot of these galleries that come and ask for their hot artists to be taken down, they don't get taken down. I don't like them. I think they should go fuck off. And I think the artist's work must uh, speak for itself. Um, and people must have access. We had a funny situation with a big gallery that wanted all their artists work down. And one of their artists included John Baldessari. And back in like 2000 or something, I had a little short audio clip of a John Baldessari piece. And it was from some kind of compilation or something, just one little thing. And I got an email from John Baldessari himself saying, this piece is not two minutes long, it's an hour and a half, and you should have the whole thing up. I'm gonna send you a file. And the next day it arrived. It was like, ah, this is great. But after John Baldessari, you know, is, is dead or is famous, you know, then suddenly their gallery comes and say, no, 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 no. You can't have John Baldessari's work there. But I was like, but John Baldessari gave me permission. And I had to go back and I had to fight with them and I had to call all this fucking work that I had to do 
about permission. And then finally the gallery said, oh, it's okay. Do you know how much work that was for me to do to get the Baldessari back or, or to keep it up? You know, that's why we don't ask permission. I don't have time to do that. I'm not a fucking lawyer. Duchamp is my lawyer. <laughs> You know, I mean, you know, listen, Jonas Mikas, I mean, you know, uh, 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 you know, what's the place in Paris? I mean, they, they, they wanted, you know, Revoir. Revoir. Everybody, you know, Jonas didn't really like Uber Web. Revoir hates, didn't want Jonas Mikas work up there. So as a result, there's no, almost like no Jonas Mikas on Uber Web. That's too fucking bad because there's really good films of Jonas Mikas that people should see. Uh, they should see it in, on the theater but they should also know it. And then now they're not going to know it. And my problem is, is that that decrease, if it's not on UberWeb, I'm sorry, because of the institutional nature, it decreases the visibility of Jonas Mikas. And I tell you what, he's going to be forgotten. I'm sorry, but if you're not on a place like UberWeb, you're probably going to end up being, being marginalized and forgotten. Students will no longer write about you if they cannot access, access your work. And that's a great way to get yourself written out of history is to take yourself off of, a place like Google Web, you know, and I, you know, I, I believe it to be true. I don't think it hurts the market of Jonas Mikas. Jonas Mikas, as I write in the book, uh, did a film screening in, in, in like something like 2016 in Brooklyn, and he was paid $20 for the screening and he hung it on his wall because it was the first time he was paid any money to show his work. So I can't imagine that Uber Web, having Jonas Mika's work on Uber Web is robbing Jonas Mika's of his work in any way. It's robbing the people that want to experience the work. And this is the problem with his generation. Most of those people don't understand that even if they're not making any money on their work, they, they can't understand the digital culture. And then you have a lot of those artists from that generation that loved their work on Ubu and, and they were like free culture people and they wanted to give it away. And then toward the end of their life, they get a little bit famous and they want all their work pulled off of Ubu, like Haroon Faraki or Tony Conrad, you know, because now they think they're important artists. And they say, no, 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 you, you have to take it off of Ubu Web. I'm too important now. Fuck you, honestly. <laughs> I say fuck you to that, you know. That's, you, you, who, you know, you're not that popular. And, and you know, and, and pop, what does popular mean? You're popular with the art collectors, with the rich people? Is that who you really want to be popular with? I once said to Lamont Young, I sat next to him at a, at a big fundraiser at, a, at, at some DIA thing, and they put the artists together. I sat next to him, I said, he said, oh, what do you do? I said, I run Uber Web. He says, oh, that's that pirate site, isn't it? <laughs> and I said, oh, you're the guy that charges $100 for an LP, right? That's why we give your work away. Why do you charge $100 when everybody else is, is charging $15 for an LP? I said, that's not, that's not democratic. He said, oh, I'm working class. I'm a working class guy. I said, well, why don't you act like it then and, and make your work accessible for people? Because if you continue to keep the prices at $100 for a record, they're going to pirate your work because they love your work. You're, you know, this is the problem. So I think there's a lot with that generation, for, whether it's Tony Conrad, Lamont Young, Haroon Faraki, or, or, or Jonas Mikas, they're, they're kind of caught in between. And this is the problem, Francesca, when you ask me about, are you an institution? The minute you begin to think of yourself as an institution, then you stop caring about people. You think, oh, I'm so important. And I don't want to do that. I want to, I, I, people need access to this work. Uh, UberWeb should not be an institution. It should be an anti-institution. I saw the uh, thing on the screen before that said, not a museum or something like that, the, hmm. yeah. the thing there. But I have to, you know, I mean, this, this, this film festival is, is ridiculous when he, when, the, when he said, oh, but if you're outside of Italy, you can't see it. And what is that? What kind of shit is that? What? How many people live in Italy? Right now, of the three of us, there's only one person in Italy, so only one person who can see that. But there's a little thing called a VPN. If you really want to see that work, you can put on your VPN to Italy and go see it. But come on. I mean, I, I get it, but that's all fucking, you know, institutional stuff. Somebody's getting paid. Somebody has a contract. The lawyer had to look at it, you know, and say that the lawyer said, well, we can only show this in Italy. I, I think that's bullshit. I think this film festival has a bullshit uh, ethos to it. It shouldn't just be in Italy. 
Well, really, why is that? Because a lawyer said, well, we only can show it in Italy. Fuck your lawyer. Duchamp is our lawyer. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, but I, I disagree with that terribly. That's not Ubu Webb's philosophy. And I don't think it's the philosophy of the filmmaker. I don't think they like it. It's a philosophy of a lawyer that said, we can only show this in Italy. And everybody says, oh, you're a lawyer. Okay. You can we'll only show it in Italy. Fuck, fuck lawyers. Fuck lawyers. All of them. We I'm, sorry. Have to, have to I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I don't mean to. I don't mean to. I don't mean to, I don't mean to you know, my house. You're very sweet. But that really rubbed me the wrong way when they said that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Do, would you like to respond? Well, I guess I guess I have to step in at this point. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I first of all, thank you so much because I I, I really appreciated the whole discussion. Actually, you went through uh, some of the main reasons why we wanted this kind of uh, conversation in the program. Like uh, we have been discussing with artists uh, from the Visio program, for example accessibility through through online uh, screenings we know uh, through many artists that we work with that there are artists that uh, although they have a market although i can name for example Basim magdi or i can name uh, uh, artists like um, that just make all their work available online so uh, basically when you're acquiring a work um, from from a gallery uh, thank god there are some uh, crazy collectors as you mentioned before that actually continue to buy uh, video works from galleries because that's a way for artists to survive in a way one of the ways um, um, that just believe that accessibility doesn't affect the value of their work so uh, as I said Basim Magdi is an example but a lot of other artists just share their work online uh, either on platforms like Vdrome that have a limited amount of time uh, for the work to be accessible or many others in the case of our festival it's not really lawyers thank god we don't have to deal with lawyers but it's uh, many many times the artists themselves uh, the artists themselves or the distributions and honestly i mean although i completely believe in the idea of accessibility being a, a way for um, art to reach also, as you said, people who don't have the privilege to travel to a fancy New York gallery to see a work, or maybe even sometimes someone who lives in New York but don't has the that doesn't have the money to pay a ticket of a, of a cinema. So I do believe that the necessity of a project like U Ubu Web to access materials that sometimes are very difficult to access. On the other hand, um, the system that supports artists through distribution, uh, artist fees, screening fees, exhibition fees, it's a way for many artists to have a little bit of income when they don't have, for example, a paid job in a, in a teaching university, like teaching in a university or, and that kind of system, I want to respect it as much as the system that grants accessibility. So. In the minute, for example, I'm asked by an artist to, we know, for example, let's say, let's talk about the festival system, the premiere system. That's even more, I imagine, kind of something that you completely uh, would vomit on, like completely uh, uh, delete from the world. The idea that if a festival in Italy shows a film to 600 people, then a festival in New York would not show the film because it's not a world premiere or an international premiere. But there are rules right now that are these, and, and unfortunately, you have to challenge them, but you have to challenge them one step at a time, at least, I think, when you are in our position. Um, because I would never, for me, the starting point is always the artist. If the artist asks me to respect something, I would always respect that, because I have 100% trust and 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 uh, support in the artist. So that's for that for me is the starting point. So the, if the artist has a system of galleries or a system of of distributors that kind of support his work through a certain dynamic, I need to respect that dynamic. And actually, you would be surprised, Kenneth, to know that we have sold already a thousand two hundred um, uh, uh, subscriptions to the festival, which is you know, kind of okay, considering that it's only in Italy and it's only artist films. Uh, 
yeah, I guess this is this is how it is. And we for many, many reasons, this is the way we had to do it. And we had artists only in one case that actually, although it was only uh, limited to Italy, they asked not to be present on the on the platform. And we respected that. I, I think it goes back to what I was saying before. It's neither, it's not all or nothing. Mm -hmm. It's a combination of everything. Um, you know, we, I have in the book a very long section about electronic arts intermix and how UberWeb has learned oh, very painfully over the years to work with the AI and, and, and how EAI actually benefits from UberWeb. You know, it's a symbiotic relationship. It's not like all or nothing. Uh, the festival is one, just is, is another another form uh, that that can work with Uberweb together. The question, Leonardo, that I the problem that I was saying is like the festival school is that why is you know I'm right now I'm in I'm just over the border from Italy and Croatia, but I can't see your films. Why? What? What's up with what's up with that? I'm close, but I can't see them. Well, as you know, unfortunately, these are not. I mean, these are decision. Uh, related to distribution, which is rarely related to artist films, more often related to documentaries. Documentaries, as you know, have sale agent that end up selling the same film in a certain territory. So let's say one film that we're showing right now in Italy for which we have the rights and we have paid for the rights in France or in Croatia or in Germany might have a different distributor. And so either we would pay a fee to all of these people or we would not be able to show the work in that territory. Legally, obviously, legally. Um, Leonardo, I'm, I'm so sorry that you have to deal with that stuff. I know, I know. I, I'm so sorry as well. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, I hear you. I understand it. But that's, we, that's where the worlds are kind of different. We're but, pirate. We're pirate. You're, you know, you're doing something legitimate. You're getting funding from 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 somewhere, government or whatever. You have to work with distributors. It's a different story. I can afford to be the the way I am, you know, because I'm I'm in just some other world. So it's can, okay. It's not a can, I, can, I, can I send you a provocation? I do believe, and this will will activate probably a very strong discussion. I do believe that without this system. Also, Wubu Web would probably have less works to show because it's true that artists, fortunately enough, even without curators, even without institutions, even without galleries, they would find a way to express themselves through works. This is something I completely believe. We are, we are not as important as we think. We really have to say this, like curators institutions are important but not as much as we sometimes think because artists always find a way on the other hand i truly believe that a system that has certain rules will help and will find you know let's talk about screening fees for example we are a festival we try always to pay for screening fees as a rule if you don't do that if every festival if every museum in the world would do that artists would probably be able to live out of their own work. That's and right. I think that would be very important. So that, to me, for example, would be a rule that everyone should have. From now on, we decide that worldwide you should pay a fee if you want to show work properly. Because yeah. that's the difference with Ubu Web. As you said, you respect the fact that there's a cinema where you can see that same work with a proper collective experience. And it's... It's different from from watching it on your own computer. So, um, I this is my provocation a little bit. I think that the let's say the system benefits from pirates projects like Ubu Web, but the other way around as well. What what would you say? About yeah, that? I mean, you know, how, how do people get shit? You know, to rip for Ubu Web. <laughs> you know, you see see. The, somebody that sends you uh, uh, sends your festival an AVI or an MP4. There's going to be somebody in your organization that's going to leak that onto the internet, and it's going to come to Ubu Web. The minute you're dealing with with reproducible media, and particularly digital, you can't keep it inside. So you're going to somebody is, is sticking DVDs in and ripping them and putting them up on file sharing on Cargarga right now as we speak. Your whole festival is probably uploaded there. And they don't, may not want to realize that, uh, may not want to acknowledge it. They can still get paid and all of that. But the fact is that that's happening. And thank you for your festival because it's enriching 
the, the uh, pirate ecosystem. Uh, <laughs> that's, we love you, thank you. We're not doing it. They don't come to us. We, we just, you know, but somebody, this is what happened uh, in video. Uh, and I tell the story in the book is that um, a, a lot of um, colleges uh, would rent films, uh, universities, and they would, and because they couldn't afford to keep renting it and the, the equipment, universities became the first pirates. And they would make pirate copies onto VHS of every film that they rented, rented once for educational purposes. And th then those VHS copies became digital when that time came and they flowed out that way. So the original pirates were actually the school libraries. Uh, and that's where so a lot of the stuff came from, you know. So, I, you know, it's going to happen. You can't keep it down. The problem with Leonardo, with what you said, is that artists, you know, put stuff on, what is it called, Vidrome? Vidrome is a platform that was initiated by Moose Magazine, and it's a platform that selects, so it's a curated platform yeah. where uh, one work at a time is presented, contextualized with like a text and, and, and so on. And it's up only for a, for a limited amount of time. So let's say two weeks. I love uh, I love those things because I, I just go download those from those places and then and then put them up on Uberweb for an unlimited amount of time. I think those are incredibly useful platforms. You know, the pirate always you know always sniffs out where the treasures are, uh, and you know if it's on the internet, you can download it. Believe me, there's no way to not download or capture something. Um, so. <laughs> I'm, maybe, uh, maybe I should stop naming platforms that you still don't know then. Uh, maybe you should <laughs> name them because honestly, you sold 12, in spite of UberWeb and my pirating, you actually sold uh, 1,200 subscriptions. You know, UberWeb is not preventing you from, from selling your things. Festivals are wonderful. People love to come to festivals. They love, there's nothing like the experience of warm bodies in a room together, experience an emotion together. Afterwards, we have a glass of wine together. You can't replace that on the internet. It's bullshit. I, I would hate it if the world was just UberWeb. You know, the, what you're doing is super important and it's about much more than the work. It's about a culture, it's about a curation, it's about a sensibility, it's about getting artists paid. It's about all of these incredible things that the internet will never be able to do. So it's not, it's not one or the other, it's, it's gonna be both. And then somebody's gonna wanna teach something from your festival and they're gonna go on to UberWeb and they're gonna, then they're gonna stream something pirated. Well, and for me, the, 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 the reason why I was so interested in organizing this talk is that in that liminal space that you just identified between, between the online, so projects like my computer and I'm listening, it's gonna yeah. die. Oh, projects like UberWeb or, and projects like, you know, a festival that streams online or that shows their work, the dialogue and the, the in that line, this is the line that we will be more and more debating in the following years. Because after a year like this, which when everyone, even the most, the strongest cinephile was confronted with the possibility of going to a cinema and so having to access films online, we would have never ever thought about doing a festival online if we would not be forced to do this. So well, that, that's, yeah, so that's what happened to Uberware. You know. space, after a year like this, uh, critical thinking and theoretical thinking will be more and more involved into analyzing what is the dialogue between these two dynamics, between the collective experience of a cinema and a gallery and the 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 accessibility granted by the internet. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 that I think both are necessary in certain. Absolutely, ways. absolutely. I don't want to be adversarial to you. I love what you do, and I, I you know, listen. You know, I'm I, I and I love. I wish I wish I, I wish I was there. I'd rather be with you at your festival than you know than where I am at the moment. You know, I mean, I'm I'm alone in somebody's office right now. It's not even my office because I, I have no internet where I where where I live here in Croatia. Yeah, I'd rather be with you. I'd rather be like having this conversation in a bar. It's much better. Yeah. So you know, what you do is super valuable and on everything. And what we do is super valuable in another way. I just don't like the idea that. Because you know that 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 because I can't be there now, I can't see your films. I can put on my VPN and see your films. Please or, do, or maybe I you know I can, but I, I just don't like that idea. Like 
you know, I, I want to see your films. I want to love your films. I want to support your filmmakers. And when your filmmakers come to New York, I want to meet them and have a glass of wine with them and see their film and have a conversation in the bar afterwards. This is what you do. And it's so fucking important. I, I'm a, you know, my system is a lonely system for sad, you know, sad guys in their in the house alone. Uh, <laughs> it's not much fun. It's important, but it's not so great. It's it 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 is it is what it is. It's not what you do. So please, I don't mean to I don't mean to uh, <laughs> to to uh, 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 say say that what you do is not good. I I just have some problems with official culture, and you know, and I think this contradiction. I work. I'm a professor at a university. You know, believe me, I have a whole official side. I publish with a, you know, with the Columbia University Press, and you know, believe me, I sign contracts and I get paid to do things. Also, I understand. I wish I could be as pure as I sound, but I actually have to. Make <laughs> I have to work as well, unfortunately. But that's the thing: of Uberweb can permit my fucking one part of me to be free, and that's only one part of me. It's not all of me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I love that. I, I I love it. I love when I can talk like a pirate. And now now tomorrow I have to you know go back into into the classroom and you know deal with administration secretaries, paying people, getting you know all the bullshit that I have to do. So you know we 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 all wear many hats. Uberweb is my pirate hat, and I I like to really be be strong with that. And for Francesco. But I, I just want to say that yeah, it's interesting also to to look at this world, which which is sometimes digital, sometimes real, sometimes like ideal, uh, like a, a place of dialectic where piracy and uh, preservation can uh, sometimes go together and sometimes uh, collide. And uh, and uh, I mean sometimes uh, even uh, talking about uh, uh, what we, we we were talking before, so the previous generation. So the uh, I don't know the I don't know. Because from 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 my perspective, I see Obu Web and the Anthology Film Archives are different, completely different uh, entities. But some way uh, c c there is a certain proximity, and uh, this is what we want to um, to make possible. Uh, it's not there. It's not there anymore. Uh, there is like uh, a fight somewhere. So we, we were talking about as a revoir, for instance. But they are doing their job, and they and and they they are, they are the opposite. And but we can, uh, I mean, some way understanding better the sense of preservation through piracy and the sense and the fact that uh, there is a like it's a, at a certain point in the book there is a dialogue between Kenneth. And uh, one of the guy who was, was working at the, the anthology film archives, uh, Lampert. And um, let me find the, 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 the quotation. Uh, Lampert says that's, uh, uh, that it's this inaccuracy that prevents Ubu Web from ever being mistaken for a proper film distributor service. And again, after listening to Lampert, I realized that although Ubu Web can give access to a cinema-based experience, Ubu Web is not cinema at all. And to me, that's the point. Uh, Ubu Web is not cinema. We we can live this in other this other experience. We have many different experiences that ca we can experience. And so uh, we can embrace the world in its complexity, and uh, and this is the one part that can uh, can help us to some some time to discover the other part of the world. So the I don't know the 35 millimeter projection, and sometimes no, just to see the shadow, and it's okay. Um, and this is what the, the world that we live. I mean, uh, it's. Uh, well, but Francesco, what you just said is not so different from accessing uh, reproduction of uh, photographies or reproduction of, of artworks in general online. To me, a work that is supposed to be an installation, as you mentioned before, that in its own parts is available in Ubu Web, for me, would be a, a, a research tool, would be a way to access okay. some information, but not, but I'm not accessing the work because the work exists within an environmental setup, exists within a dialogue between screens, and maybe even more exists in, in the collective experience of being in a space, being in the work, and immersed in the work. So 
What I and and I think in if we see it in this sense, which I I'm sure you agree somehow or I believe, uh, Ubu Web is the possibility to access certain information in the same way that when you are in Argentina and you cannot travel to Florence to see the David, you buy a book and you look at photographs of the David in a book, even details maybe, even you know, and you have the possibility to look at something and access a visual information of what you're seeing. So in this set, if you see it in this way, it is true that this doesn't take anything away from the value of the artwork itself, which is the argument that many artists that are okay with the idea of their work being disseminated online, mm -hmm. they take it as a, you know, this is the, the argument. The argument is, if my work is available online, this doesn't take away anything to the fact that my work is actually the one you see in a gallery. Because in the exact same way in which if a photograph of my painting is not the painting, somehow. At some, sometimes we can even love the shadow of the work. I mean, and that part can be a work itself. This is what I like also. This is what, what, what happened at Lincoln Center when Kenneth showed the, the shadows on the, on the big screen. Mm -hmm. And exactly what, what happened in Venice when we decided to select mm -hmm. some part of the, of the films, uh, asking the, the authors to, to, I mean, the permission in that case, and we show them in, the, in, a, in a supermarket on, a, on the Fresco's facade. I mean, it was not the best condition, but we loved it. Absolutely. And sometimes we can even love this uh, uh, situationist derive that we can have with the works. And uh, sometimes we have to respect the work as, as it is uh, and create the perfect condition and, uh, and to be like uh, in, in, the preserve, uh, in a preservative way. But uh, somewhere, someone, some, some way and somewhere we can invent a way to or even to not preserve, but to stretch the identity of the work, to destroy the integrity and uh, to, to discover another work. You know, I found my version of that sentence that gives the title of this talk. The, the version that works for me is the artist is my lawyer. So if the artist is happy with stretching the work, if the artist is happy with, you know, calling you John Baldessari and saying, why do you want to show one minute? I'll just give you the whole film. Like in that case, I'm all up for it. I'm all that's up. The, uh, that's the optimal situation. But again, if Uberweb had to ask every artist if they were okay, I would have had to have asked 5,000 filmmakers if that's okay. And most of them would say, no, it's not okay. And I want some money and I want this. So I, I, I hear you from, <laughs> I wish I could no, do that's not, that. I said, that's my, I know I, that, uh, that yeah. you will stay on Duchamp. I don't want to come <laughs> No, I can't. <laughs> yeah, you can. I mean, I, you know, there's certain things we can do. Again, in the, utop in the utopian space of Uberweb, it's possible. That's all. It's just like this kind of like, you know, Hakeem Bay temporary autonomous zone of Uberweb, where where the un, impossible is possible, and I think that's really what it's what's cool about it. Um, I wish my life was that possible. It's not, you know. But there, in that moment, it, it really is. So, uh, you know, I wish, yeah. But anyway, I think it's funny that we're still having these conversations all these years down the line. You know, I had this. I remember one time going to uh, Oberhausen film, you know, the short film festival, being invited there and having the same conversation was a really long time ago, maybe 15 years ago. And we're still having this conversation. I think it's funny that we're still having this conversation. Why should we? Why it, means, it probably means that it's a meaningful one. I also had, I also went to Oberhausen a few years ago. And um, the, the one metaphor that I always use sometimes to go a little bit on your pirate side, uh, when when filmmakers of a different generation or even curators are too radical with with the, a certain kind of presentation, I always make the metaphor of the Japanese soldier on an island that th still thinks that there's the Second World War out there, and it's there at the machine gun protecting his own little little tiny island. I kind of agree very much that the world has changed so much in the past years. And the relationship we have with the internet is something we absolutely need to understand and negotiate with. And in this case, this is why I think Ubu Web was really avant-garde, since you use this word, uh, to, the, to the world we're living today. This is, uh, I mean, it's no doubt about it. 
So I think it's even more interesting now to discuss this of how the structure of something that a few years ago was so radical, uh, how, it, how, how it is now, what is this bringing now? This I think yeah. is really interesting. Yeah. Obviously it's still controversial and it still to some people is radical. To me, what I find is radical about it is is that it, it's done like a uh, like very similar to to what you were saying, uh, Leonardo. Uh, it's curated, you know. So like lots of most of Uber Web is on YouTube. I think a lot of people have downloaded stuff from Uber Web and put it on YouTube. Uh, all, much of it is on, on archive.org, but it's the organizational and the curatorial mind that makes the collection have some coherence and some kind of sense, even if it's incorrect the way that I'm talking about the avant-garde since I really don't know what I'm doing. At least there's some, you know, why do we still listen to the radio when, when we have uh, Spotify? You want somebody to guide you through something. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of fucking songs. You know, you need an organizational principle. And that's what is not happening on Vimeo. And, you know, you talked about the uh, Moose Magazine site. It's curated. That something is written. You know, you need somebody to tell you what's good and what's not good, you know. Um, and I think that's what's lacking on Vimeo and all the artist sites and, you know, is the centralization of a, of a curatorial vision, however wrong it may be, um, in order to show you what's good. That doesn't seems to be out of style now. Uh, everything is just kind of scattered all over the place. I love the idea that it all lives in one roof. Uh, even if that's a fucked up leaky roof, it's, it's, it's there. Uh, it's context is meaning is now meaning. So that's, that's why Uber web remains important. I think because nobody else does that anymore. No, nope, it's not a thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I just want to call for questions because I was asking if, if there are some comments, I just want to reiterate the fact that if, I mean, we're already one hour and a half into the talk, but yeah. I see that there's still quite, quite a lot of people connected. Uh, if they have any questions, please, this is the moment to shoot them in as comments in, in the Facebook page and we'll be able to um, to pick them up. Uh, and and the, what you can't ask me, can I have my films on Uber Web? <laughs> that's, not a, that's not a good question. <laughs> well, I can make you laugh since we were talking about Dada or I think Jari, for example, would have loved this. The first uh, comment that came in at the beginning of the conversation was, who is he? <laughs> With a question mark. <laughs> I think that's quite that's interesting. Great. I'm glad that people aren't like, oh, this so is It might be referred to you because I was the first face coming up, but who is he? I think it's quite... Uh, yeah. Anyway, I mean, we don't have to, you know, I think maybe we should wind it down. Maybe we've done enough talking for a long time. Um, and I think maybe, Leonardo, next, next time we should have this conversation in person together at, at the festival. You, you know, have, really, a, and, um, have a and, permanent um, invitation, absolutely. And, that's what I like. and Francesco as well. This has to, has to continue. Thank let, you. Me, let me just... <coughs> Maybe while, while we're waiting for uh, questions, let me just tell that, um, let, let me just come back to, um, to Jonas, uh, because um, amazing people are actually taking care of his work uh, and, his pre and the preservation of his work uh, uh, nowadays, starting from uh, Sebastian Mech as his son, uh, uh, and also Pip Chadrov, I have to say. Um, so uh, that's it, but um, we still believe, we, we really believe uh, in the conversation uh, that brought us uh, working both with, uh, with Jonas and Kenneth. Uh, maybe the conversation uh, is not in, uh, in, in the best moment, uh, no. but we don't care. Uh, uh, the important thing is the conversation. Uh, I, wish, I wish we could have had this conversation when Jonas was alive. He would just send me really nasty emails to Uberweb. Who the fuck are no, you talking about Barbara Rubin? Yeah. You're showing Barbara uh, Rubin not, on Uberweb. Uh, not so, uh, so negative. <laughs> so it, it really depended on, uh, on the moment and time. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, he's an artist, you know, it's cranky. It's, it's, it's cool. You know, I get, I get it. I'm, you know, I have that side of me too, but. He really uh, wanted uh, you to ask him to take the uh, the work on Ubu, actually. <laughs> oh, oh well, it's too late. 
that was with, uh, there's always an invitation. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, then we're gonna wrap it up. Uh, okay. Bennett and Francesco, thank you so, so much for being with us. And uh, next you. step will be to bring you back and hopefully have yeah. a conversation in Florence. Yeah, we'll do a, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do, it, we'll do a, a little pirate section uh, of your film festival. We'll sneak in bad quality films with mm -hmm. nobody's permission. Do, we won't tell anybody, it'll be a little pirate cinema, okay? In real life. I don't have an artist in my mind uh, that you should collaborate with on that. Let's, okay. let's talk about it. You know, um, you, yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. I will just remind to who is still uh, connected that we will have another conversation on Friday at 3 p.m. Uh, with uh, Beatrice Bulgari, Han Nefkens, and Mason Lever Yap about commissioning artists' moving images. And, uh, and then again, please go on, on my movies and check our program. Tonight there's another talk live at 7 p.m. with the platform. It's all free, it's all accessible, so please, please follow us. And once again, thank you all. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.